Good afternoon and welcome, dear friends, to this amazing Saturday, the first Saturday of February 2022, when we kickstart with Kirsten today, um, giving us another uh, word on enlightenment from Joanna De Angelis. But before we go into that, and before we announce what she's bringing to us, what a beautiful topic, let us um, usually, as we do usually, uh, read a passage of the book, Happy Life, and uh, then pray together um, so we can go into uh, the, the great uh, work that is to enroll before us today. Joanna De Angelis also in this book, Happy Life, um, through the hands of the medium, uh, the Valdo Pereira Franco says the following, take care of your emotions. An affected attitude is always disagreeable, just as unjustifiable reserve is responsible for many difficulties in social relationships. Affected affectation is a behavior of disturbance and reserve is a symptom of insecurity. Analyze yourself with love and sincerity in an attempt to overcome the anxieties and fears that dictate your conduct. Calm attitudes are the results of inner growth, which will only acquire, which you will only acquire, excuse me, through the exercise of prayer, patience, and meditation. In this way, the control of your emotion becomes possible. So dear friends, as we give ourselves welcome, let us welcome one another with our prayer. We ask you that you follow um, toward so we can truly bring this to our hearts and to our homes as well. Dear Mother, Father God, we ask you that you bless our hearts and our minds. Now that we are connected with one another, streaming through the web, but we ask that we are able to bring these teachings to our homes, this moment to our homes, to truly dive in into the teachings that we are about to receive and exercise them. Bless each one of us connected in this work. Bless, bless each one of us who are trying to do our best. We also ask that you guide the minds and hearts of our dear friends who may not have a moment like this or who wishes to be doing anything else but to connect with you, dear Lord. We are also our brothers and sisters in need of help. Let us send them our good vibrations, those who are in despair, those who are going through troubled times, but do not know how to settle down and pray. We also ask that you guide the heart and mind of our dear sister Kirsten, who will be conducting this evening's talk and bringing us the amazing topic of resentment. This way, dear Lord, may we all learn from one another and get closer to you, and so be it. And as we are saying, dear friends, welcome to this amazing Saturday, to this moment that we come together at the SSB, still streaming, yes, not physically yet, but pretty soon we'll get there, uh, to share with you another chapter, right here, some chapter 11 of the book by Duana Gilles, entitled Times of Health and Conscientiousness. And the topic that Kirsten will be bringing to us today is entitled, the, 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 the chapter um, is the tragedy of resentment. With no further ado, I'd like to pass the word to you, Kirsten. Please take us away. Thank you. Thanks so much, Leo. I just had a little bit of a technical difficulty over here. Bear with me just one second. As you just mentioned, uh, doing things virtually, sometimes these things happen. So we just have to hold on and work through them. So bear with me um, as we do this. But today's topic, before I go into it, is going to be on the tragedy of resentment. Um, I'm still having some technical difficulties over here. Um, the tragedy of resentment. So as soon as we can 
get that up for you. We will begin. So we'll go ahead and start, even though um, we seem to be missing our PowerPoint, but it's okay. The tragedy of resentment. Oh, wait, hold on. I think I got it. God, this yes. is not a tragedy. This is actually just a, uh, <laughs> this is just like a little food, it is, right? <laughs> yes, th this is uh, testing our, our patience today amongst other things, right? Take your time and so, soon you'll be able to reopen. There it is. Yeah, we got it. We got it. Okay. All right. You guys are seeing my screen because I can't see myself anymore. Perfectly fine. Yes. We're good. Cool. Great. Thank you. All right. Wow. So what a way to start a presentation, right? I mean, this is real life. This is us dealing with our own emotional health. We're dealing with the stresses. And this is not unlike what happens in this virtual or semi-virtual world that we uh, have to live in sort of, at least for now, given the circumstances of the reality of the pandemic. And much like what you just saw, which was not staged, um, does cause a lot of frustration. It causes a lot of angst, you know, a lot of different emotions come up because of this. And through our lifetime, we experience this. And one of the things that we all have experienced to some varying degree or not, is this emotion of resentment or this feeling of resentment. So let's talk a little bit about what resentment means. But as usual, before we get into that, and before we dive into it, Joanna always starts out every chapter with affirmations. And we always say we believe that she she does this is because she wants us to kind of gear up, get ready, because dealing with our emotions is not easy. Dealing with our own emotions, dealing with our own shadows, but also to fine tune ourselves, to fine tune ourselves much like uh, any, pardon the, the noise here, much like any musician or singer before they go on stage they have to do a warm-up or they do a tune-up so it's the same thing with with our own selves with our emotions with our vibrations so these positive affirmations which are always specific to the topic that we're about to dive into so it allows us to just connect and so whatever you're doing right now i just want you to stop unless you're driving, and that's a different story. You shouldn't be listening to this while you're driving. But if you're at home, which I hopefully you are, you're sitting in a comfortable position, I want you to take this moment and really repeat these words either off the screen or repeat them after me, because it's really important. Starts out like this. Divine forgiveness sweetens and soothes me. Divine forgiveness sweetens and soothes me. It gives me the extent of love's therapeutic power. It gives me the extent of love's therapeutic power. I begin to see the world and people differently, correctly, positively. I overcome the resentments that used to torment me. I overcome the resentments that used to torment me. I begin to live without the chains that used to hold me back. I begin to live without the change, chains that used to hold me back. I recover the joy of living and being natural, loving all with tenderness, even those who do not correspond to my affection. I recover the joy of living and being natural, loving all with tenderness, even those who do not correspond to my affection. Take a deep breath in and out. Let us be present in this moment. Let us be rem in remembrance of this moment. And as we finalize 
all is well with me now because I feel good about life. All is well with me now because I feel good about life. Our words have power more than what may, we may actually realize, or maybe we do realize it, and we just fall into old patterns. But what we say, the words we express, the thoughts that we have, and the feelings that we feed have power. So let us be mindful and intentional with those things. So we, before we begin to talk about resentment, we always like to define it. And for the sake of respecting the history of language and words, which we are fascinated by, we wanted to bring the definition of resentment from the Oxford English Dictionary or the OED. So the English word resentment is actually derived from the obsolete French, French word resentir, which meant the re-experience of a strong feeling, sentir. Um, but these meanings are obsolete for resentment no longer refers to re-experiencing sentiments in general, but only of negative sentiments relating to grievances, injuries, patterns of unfair treatment, violation, unfulfilled or frustrated desires, and mostly and most generally unjustified suffering at the hands of another or others. The sentiments associated with resentment include ill will, bitterness, and anger. So in other words, things that we generally don't really like, they're not positive things. Feeling resentment generally comes when someone else is not meeting our expectations. When we feel like we're frustrated because something on the exterior is not meeting what we believe to be true in the interior of ourselves. Something to be, uh, to be cognizant of, and we're going to get into this. So some of the origins of resentment are, can, can be lack of change, not feeling seen or heard. And all of these things can happen at work. They happen in our relationships at work, our relationships in our family. They happen on the internet. They happen with people that we're conversing with virtually, people that we're interacting with virtually. So independent of how we're interacting, these things can happen. Another uh, origin of resentment is not asking for what you need, vague boundaries, lack of accountability, saying yes when you want to say no, ignoring your intuition, lack of following through, conflict avoidance, not respecting your own boundaries. And these are just some of the things that can trigger it. But Joanna actually goes into something that is even much more profound or profound and very much on a uh, macro level looking down at the micro. So uh, as a whole in the world, this just doesn't pertain to the United States or, or Europe or, you know, South America. This pertains to the entire world. And she says the following, that psychosocial, socio-emotional, economic, and other pressures trigger various disorders that affect a wide range of society. Psychosocial, socio-emotional, economic, and other pressures trigger various disorders that affect a wide range of society. She goes on, causing fear, anxiety, resentment. They destabilize the nervous system and cause serious neuroses, which are nearly always somatized, which basically is a fancy word to say it's felt in our body and are responsible for allergic, gastrointestinal, the stomach, metabolic infirmities in general, and fostering degenerative processes. And that could be any degenerative process or any metabolic infirmity that one might think of allergic, gastrointestinal, metabolic, and degenerative processes. 
these are a consequence, can be a consequence of these emotions, fear, anxiety, resentment, and ones that are related to it, that actually destabilize our nervous system. Our nervous system consists of our central nervous system and our autonomic nervous system. No, don't worry, this is not a uh, college class, not even close, or it even, you know, class on um, anatomy and physiology. But just so we understand, we have a nerve, we have a central nervous system. And there's a subcategory of having one that's called, you know, your autonomic uh, nervous system as well as the other one I mentioned. But all this to say is our central nervous system, our nervous system is quite important in the ways in which we act in the world. Having that balanced is vital. So there are times where people might say, well, I don't, I don't have any anxiety. I don't have any resentments. And Joanna's going to tell us, she's going to reveal to us that there are people, us, not our neighbors, you know, let's not think about, oh, my uncle, my cousin, you know, my partner. There are a lot of us that have these somatic illnesses, remember, illnesses of the body, that are actually manifestations of these emotions that are not being dealt with anxieties, resentments, fear, and all the other emotions, because there's a lot of other emotions related to those that they could probably spend an hour or more getting into that affect us. And she's sharing this to say that these psychosocial, social, emotional, and economic, these triggers a lot of disorders. So the stress that we're experiencing and she doesn't even mention the pandemic here. This is just, in general, we experience stress within ourselves and then how we interact with others in society. And then sometimes the way that society is set up and how it affects our emotional state and just the economics of the world or the culture or what have you that we're in that triggers a lot of the stress. A lot of things can trigger us. Sometimes we're not even aware of what those things are as a sidebar. Let's progress on because science has already validated what spiritism is bringing to us, what Joanna is bringing to us, that there is a correlation. For science, it's sort of up in the air, correlation versus causation, but there is some sort of correlation between the as we could see here from um, this research that I'm sharing, that they've examined the relationship between resentment and macro sociological processes of social class competition. And if you're interested, you can go and, and research this particular topic and you can find a whole lot of information on it. All this to say, you know, living in society and because we are social beings can cause stress and can cause these emotions, multiple different emotions, good. And we're not going to say bad. We're not going to call any emotions bad because they're not bad. No emotion is bad. We say bad sometimes just to give it a, to qualify it, but really no emotions are bad. They are just signals of where we're at, alerting us where we're at. Joanna goes on to say that under pressure, fragile temperaments look for escape mechanisms and either fall into phobic and depressive states or resort to aggressiveness to affirm and defend their personality. So it's kind of like when we're under pressure, it's a fight or flight. Either we charge, become aggressive, or we relent and we recoil into ourselves and become fearful. And a lot of psychological residue, listen to this, psychological residue. Do we know, we, so let's 
think about this for a second, residue, you could think about residue kind of like if you've ever used oil on your hands or your hair, and if you use it, you know, with, without a glove, um, and you put it in your hair, you know, and even though you might even wash your hands, you still feel some of that residue on your hands. Sometimes you can have that experience with certain types of soaps um, and those sorts of things. So it's like this residual leftover. So psychological residue, Joanna's saying. So these emotions leave a residue that take root in our emotional and mental field. So even if we're past that feeling, it can leave that residue, leading to behavioral disturbances and various diseases that cannot be diagnosed accurately. So if you think about if we are entertaining the, the feeling of resentment, anger, uh, host, um, hostility, or you know all of the so-called deemed negative for the sake of the, our conversation, emotions, they can leave a residue, the psychological residue, and it takes root. And when something takes root, if you've ever seen, if you've ever grown a plant inside of a clear vase or vase, and you've ever seen like the roots of the plant, they go down deep. So even if you were to, you know, break off a better part of that plant, it very well just might grow back. So unless you take it out by the root, it's gonna stay there. Something for us to think about and published in a well-known scientific journal, The Lancet Psychiatry, was the following research, which we found very interesting because when we talk about psychological residue, we were trying to think of something that it was analogous to or something that was related to, something more tangible that we could feel, and also just what science has to say about all this. Well, something really interesting. They've actually found, because remember, Joanna said that these, um, these emotions, resentment, fear, uh, resentment can actually become manifested in the physical body. They, be, they can become somatic disturbances or illnesses. One of those things being allergic, and just to understand, and we're not trying to get too overly technical or make this a medical presentation. However, sometimes that's it's how it goes. But allergic reaction refers, it's an immune response. It's when our immune system is like, it revs up. It, it, imagine these like little army inside of yourself. It starts to all get together and fight off whatever the foreign, you know, body is or the foreign uh, microbe might be. So sometimes we have allergic reactions and we have these immune, what we call immune activations that happen. And so let's read this and let's talk about this because this is really important. In this particular research, and we'll read the following. The role of immune activation in psychiatric disorders has attracted considerable attention over the past two decades, contributing to the rise of a new era of psychiatry. Microglia, the macrophages, and they are a type of white blood cell that, um, remember how we said when there's an immune response and there's like there's little soldiers come out to like fight? Well, those are called macrophages. They're just part of the immune response of everybody's body. Everybody has them, um, generally speaking. So just a little side note. Microglia, the macrophages of the brain, and the microglia are specific type of macrophages that are in the brain. We have different types that are throughout the body. Microglia, the macrophages of the brain, are progressively becoming the main focus of the research in this field. Although microglia activation has been noted in all types of psychiatric disorder, no association was seen with specific diagnostic categories. So we discussed, psycho, uh, in this particular research, um, was discussed psychosocial stress as one of the main factors determining microglial activation in patients with psychiatric disorders and explore the relevance 
of these things for future treatment and strategies. So all this to say, and here we brought just a diagram of the psychosocial stress, which is one of the things that Joanna talked about, that it causes inflammation. Re Re Joanna referred to the um, allergic words she used. This is what this is. Science is saying, yes, we, we are we are seeing this. We are seeing this. This is a specific uh, research they were doing with psychiatric patients, patients that suffer from anxiety, depression, and the whole gamut. It could be everything from really, really mild to extreme. But they found these microglial cells in abundance in people that were going through psychosocial stress. So the new thought or the potential new thought in recent years is looking at anti-inflammatory treatment. What does that mean? Well, if you have a fire and you want to put it out, you throw water on it, right? Simple. So anti-inflammatory is sort of like that in, in the most simplistic of terms. It's trying to get down the inflammation. But we know that it's not the exterior that's going to fix the interior. We can mitigate our, our symptoms and absolutely it's good for us to be thinking about an anti-inflammatory diet. It's healthy for us, not just because it's anti-inflammatory, but because overall it's healthy for us. There's research that has shown eating more vegetables, eating more plant-based, although we're not saying you need to go 100% plant-based here, but we're just saying incorporating these more into your diet has, is already scientifically proven to be better for your health. Absolutely. And we should do all these things on the external to alleviate the pain that we're experiencing, whatever it is. However, we cannot get away from a singular truth that exists. We cannot get away with something that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11, when Jesus said, listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Why do we bring this? Because we, for lack of a better term, we, the immortal spirit that we are, we are the ones that bring about any dis any illness to our physical body. We are the source of it. So yes, we can change our diets and we can eat healthy and we can do all these wonderful things. But until we learn to work on ourselves, our morality, our spirituality, connect with God, make those things a priority in our lives, Everything on the exterior is just going to be a temporary fix. And for some people, that's what it is. But we know real, true healing comes with when we're making that internal shift. And this is not an opportunity for us to start passing judgment on others saying, oh, look, he or she is sick. Well, that because they're sick in the mind or because of this, this is not the purpose. The purpose is this is for us to go inside to do our own self evaluation, because that is key and vital for our own happiness, our own well being. And it's brought to us in the gospel. You know, when, when, and also in the Bible, when Jesus says, go first and be reconciled with your brother before presenting your offering at the altar. In the gospel says he, Jesus, he is teaching that the sacrifice most pleasing to the Lord is a sacrificing of one's resentment that before presenting oneself to God in order to be forgiven, it is necessary to have forgiven to have given forgiveness. And then if a wrong has been committed against any brother or sister, it is necessary to have repaired it. 
So before we want to go enjoy the this some splendor or idea of what heaven could be, before we reach that, we need to fix our relationships here on earth. But those around us. But remember, Joanna didn't just say social, so, socio-emotional. She said psycho-social, socio-emotional. And there was a third one that I'm completely blanking on. And forgive me on that. Economic. These are all the triggers, things that can trigger us. So when we talk about psychosocial, socio-emotional, that's not just, oh, the exterior coming in. It's our interior, how we are relating to the world around us. And what is the world around us? People. People. Those are our struggles because people can trigger us. And the triggering is good because the triggering, we can look at in the same way if we were to look at our emotions, not as bad or good, but as signals to dig deeper. So if we're being triggered, it's because there's something behind there to be looked at. And that this idea that is brought to us in the gospel according to spiritism, that what God wants from us is that ability for us to work on ourselves. You know, God doesn't want sacrifices. You know, it's great when we can do lots of uh, external things to make ourselves feel better. And those are wonderful and they can really help us. However, when it boils down to it, it's, it's about what's inside, inside of us. Because that is what will manifest outward. And in the book, And Life Goes On, there's this particular quote from one of the mentors. And this is the beauty of spiritism. This is the beauty of believing in reincarnation and the existence of reincarnation. Is that we can transform resentment into love by means of the therapy of forgetfulness. So this is why we're born back into the same family settings again and again in hopes that we can try again. That's, that's, that's our purpose. That's why we live in families. That's why we people of all walks of life have challenges in family. We all do. Unless you are near perfection or perhaps you've reached that level and maybe you're not even, uh, you're just one of those special people in this world. You're, you're just highly evolved. But the vast majority of the inhabitants of this earth, this is our, our struggle. This is our struggle and we need to learn how to manage it, how to get through it. And one of those ways is to understand the power that we have as individuals. The power that I have. Remember when Jesus said about faith, if we tell a mountain to move from one place to another, it will. Jesus was illustrating how much power we have to make ourselves to make our own lives a living hell or a living heaven. Joanna goes on to say, sensitive individuals who cannot endure and overcome such constricting pressures, pressures lapse into resentment, which makes them miserable and predisposes them to react all the time by shooting poisonous darts at their real or imagined enemies. 
So when we are weak and we succumb to our own, to the pressures of this world, and we become miserable, we get angry. And we're shooting these, these poisonous, invisible darts. Sometimes to our, our real enemies, pe- enemies, people who we believe have wronged us, or vice versa. But some poison themselves with, bi- with bitterness and wither away. It goes back to that somatic illnesses. Others subconsciously become victims of emotional, financial, and social setbacks. So look at this. She's not just talking about our emotions and, and somatic illnesses. She's saying here that this is overflowing into other areas of our lives, even financial. that we can fall victim, although none of us are victims, but when we are falling to the pressures, to the stress, we can become really resentful. Many have no self-esteem. They see themselves as worthless and play the game of self-destruction. Resentment is responsible for many of the tragedies that place that take place every day day. Remember how we said we started out with the affirmations because our words have power. If we are so intent, if we are resentful and we are picturing even unconsciously, unintentionally imagining someone that we dislike, we are sending them a mental dart that's poisonous. And if that person is at the same vibration that we are, it's going to hit them. If they're not, if their vibration is higher, they're tuned to higher minds, then it's not going to affect them. Something for us to think about, because not only are we throwing these darts, there are darts being thrown at us, and sometimes we don't even realize it. It could be at work. It could be at the supermarket. It could be while you're driving and someone's cutting you off or vice versa. And one rule of thumb, you know, we, we're always taught is if someone's trying to merge into your lane, let them merge. Because can you imagine how many times, perhaps maybe not so much since the pandemic, but how many times we've seen in our, in our lifetime, someone trying to merge into a lane and we speed up. That's a mental dart for sure is being thrown our way. Or it's highly likely, unless that person is really uh, kind and understanding. And maybe they'll, they'll say, God bless, God bless that person. Maybe they were having a bad day. It's always good to be good. You never know what someone's going through. But this is our personal power that we have. So if we have this power to throw poisonous darts what if we were to turn that around in a positive sense all the good that we can do that's our power how do we overcome this resentment it's not easy it's going to require us acknowledging one that we're feeling this emotion acknowledging that I've been triggered, acknowledging that I'm, I'm imperfect, and then doing the work on myself to dig deeper. Joanna says, resentment is a poison that kills its host. As it vibrates in the emotions, it wreaks havoc on the more subtle nerve equipment and produces dysrhythmia, which is an abnormal heartbeat, oscillating blood pressure, blood pressure that's just all over the place, and heart problems. And it makes sense when we're talking about resentment or any kind of emotion that it's right at that 
that level of this vital center or shock or another religious um, arena, as I call it, that it really just causes stress right to our heart. There's even a type of heart disease um, that happens. And it's, it's Takusoba or Takisoba or something like that. Um, it's named after, um, I think, the scientists that, that discovered it. Um, but it actually means, in layman's terms, broken heart uh, syndrome or disease. Because that stress manifests in our body and can manifest on our heart, causing all types of chaos. She says, it's not worth letting oneself be poisoned by resentment. It's not worth it. What are we gaining? Me, the immortal spirit, what am, what am I gaining from that? Think about it for a second. Yes, I'm, I'm upset. Yes, I'm angry. But what am I gaining from this? I'm giving that other person the power. And we don't want to give anyone else power in our lives. We want to take charge of our lives and be intentional. She goes on to say, resentment does not always manifest patently. Remember, we were talking about this earlier. It camouflages itself in mental fixation and sometimes goes completely unnoticed. And that's why sometimes people might have physical illnesses and have no idea that it's correlated to their emotions whatsoever. Because we can be blinded to our own selves. That's why in psychology, one of the archetypes, uh, Jungian archetypes, is the shadows, which is nothing else other than the fancy word um, to describe, you know, uh, representation of this part of ourselves that is hidden or the unconscious part of ourselves. So sometimes we don't even know that it's there. That's why this time we need to make for ourselves on a daily basis is vital for self-reflection. And not being afraid to challenge our own selves and the different parts of ourselves. Challenge our own beliefs about things. And question ourselves if perhaps we could look at something a different way. Maybe we've been accustomed to looking at it that way our entire lives. And many people throughout history have used that as an excuse. Well, this is the way it's always been done. But that doesn't mean that it can't change or that it needs to change. Just some food for thought. Joanna goes on to say, there are resentful people who do not even realize it. A serious self-examination will help you identify it in the folds of your soul. Then, as you continue your quest and analysis, you will uncover its roots when it first began and why it became ingrained in your being and began disturbing you. So this is about going deeper into your own mind, your own heart, your own emotions, just digging beneath the surface of who I am. And please don't think that any of us that give these lectures have surpassed this or have um, been able to uh, perfect this. Not at all. We are all together in this. All of us struggle all of us have our hardships. But that doesn't mean that we can't support one another in a loving way. That we can't create, or we should create space, safe spaces for open discussions. And what a world we would live in where we could feel safe enough to discuss our own imperfections. And in return, receive support from others around us. 
But this is the way to overcome resentment. This is the way to overcome any disturbing emotion or any emotions that disturb you. It's this serious self-examination. And sometimes this serious self-examination needs to happen with a licensed professional. And that's okay. It's becoming more and more normal, less taboo, less stigmatized. Really, it should be as we see our dentist every six months. Yes, every six months is when you're supposed to see your dentist. If you, you see your primary care provider, your doctor, your nurse practitioner once a year for your annual exam, your mammogram, or what have you, whatever annual or, you know, every few year exam that you need to have. Seeing a mental health professional should also be one of those things where it's completely normal. Sometimes it should be much more frequent than just annually or biannually or quarterly until we get the hang of really doing that internal work inside of ourselves. It becomes more and more natural when we're constantly doing it. It's work for sure. But she goes on to say, you will be surprised to discover that you're responsible for giving it shelter and strength, letting yourself be consumed by it. What she's talking about is resentment. You'll be surprised to discover that we are giving shelter to resentment and allowing ourselves to be consumed by it. So we have to take a step back and think about that for a second and think about what am I not aware of? If Joanna says there are people that are so engulfed in this, have no idea that they are knee deep in resentment, it begs the question, what am I unaware of? Am I, do I have resentments that I'm not examining inside of myself? Am I holding on to resentments? How do I know? Well, one, I could say perhaps easy way, I don't know if it's easy as the term, but one easy way is, is to think about the different people in your lives who you've had issues with. And when you begin to think about them, do they trigger you? Do you feel that unrest, that uneasiness? And you have to do that self-examination. Am I feeling resentful? Until we acknowledge and find the issue, we can't fix it. And one of the ways also, a couple of, of additional ways that these, again, it's called negative emotions, though we are not calling it that because no emotions are negative. They're just signals. But for the sake of this conversation, we're calling them negative just for, exact, for qualitative purposes. Six ways negative emotions impact your overall health. And this is scientifically proven. Raise your risk of heart disease. The impact uh, the impact, the efficiency of your medication and your willingness to take them can result in inflammatory skin conditions, weaken your immune system, lead to digestive disorders, lead to hormonal imbalances. Remember all those things Joanna was talking about that it causes? Science has already said it does. It's already proven it. So if these are causing some of these illnesses, which are pretty widespread, heart disease is the top 10 killers of the, in the world amongst other diseases in the world, illnesses, diseases. Now we're not saying that every single person that has heart disease, it's because they're a resentful person or they're resenting someone. No, don't box people into categories and boxes. Take them out. Because this purpose of this is not for us to diagnose others. Purpose of all of this information is for us to go inside and make our own self-analysis, our own self-examination, and be honest with ourselves. Be honest. 
because we want to overcome resentment. We don't want to get sick. We don't want to be sick. I don't think anybody wants to be sick. It's not fun. It's costly. Coming from a healthcare about a healthcare background, there are billions of dollars that are spent each year. Billions and tr trillions of dollars that are spent on managing all of these major diseases, at least here in the US. Don't know the numbers outside, but I imagine that they're they're similar, that there's still millions. Just just thought, throwing it out there. She goes on to say the following, people who have been mean to you, family, acquaintances, teachers, in childhood, throughout your life, have no idea to this day what they did and still do to you. So there are resentments that we hold on to from people that have completely moved on, have no clue that they've hurt us. And they moved on with their life. Yet we're still harboring it. They remain oblivious to their excesses and inconsistencies in that regard. They themselves suffered the same attacks when they were children and are only reacting as others did toward them. Your first step is to sympathize with them and realize they are neither responsible for nor aware of their actions, nor are they ill-intentioned toward you. So these, we would say, sick, unwell individuals that have hurt us, and that can be in any type of way, shape, or form, one way to begin to open the door to forgiveness. Now, remember, forgiveness is not saying what they did was okay. It's not saying that, oh, ahead, go ahead and do it to somebody else, that I'm condoning it. It's saying for my own happiness and mental health, I need to be able to forgive, to be able to move on. Otherwise, I'm always going to be linked vibrationally to that person. Because the mental chain are like two, like a long chain with hooks on the end. It's one hook on me. And I cast my hook out to that person. So wherever they go in the universe, I'll be connected to them. Because I maintain resentment and anger and hatred towards them. And one way for us to begin to open that door is to sympathize, to understand that hurt people hurt people. That offenders especially of sexual abuse, those who are the so-called perpetrators, eight or nine times out of 10, they themselves were victims of that. And once again, not condoning, not giving them a pass, just explaining the process of how hurt people hurt people. So when we begin to sympathize with them and realize that they're neither responsible for nor aware of their actions, nor are they ill intentioned towards you, they don't hate us. You know, that kid in, in grammar school that bullied you because you tripped and fell down the steps or because you had weird hair, or because your parents didn't have money and you didn't wear nice clothes to school, the bullies, or even in, in high school or college, or even nowadays we find there are bullies in, 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 in the workplace. Those people are not aware of what they're doing because cycles just repeat themselves until someone stops them, until someone says, wait, I'm hurting and I'm hurting others. Otherwise, they live in this loop that constantly repeats itself. It's not saying that, oh, 
they're not responsible for what they're doing. No, we are each responsible we, to take responsibility of our own actions. But that it's an explanation for why things happen the way that they do. We are creatures of, we are, we tend to be creatures of habit. So unless we learn to break that negative cycle that we've learned, we're bound to repeat it. Unless we say, no, this is wrong. What happened to me was wrong. Let me get assistance. Let me stop, reflect, forgive, and understand. We are all imperfect. And if we were to only look at this from a singular lifetime, it wouldn't make sense. But because we believe in multiple incarnations, we know that we've lived a millennia of lifetimes. So we always have to add in that factor. Joanna, Joanna finishes up saying, consequently, or she's finishing up, consequently, you can understand and forgive them, setting yourself free. And forgiveness has so many benefits. Forgiving a partner who's done wrong and is trying to make amends can boost your self-respect, science has found out through research. Yes, you can boost your own self-respect by forgiving your partner. And people who practice forgiveness regularly have a stronger sense of identity and increased self-respect, another scientific fact that they found through research. These are just some of the pearls that we've pulled out. Why beginning the journey of forgiveness is important. Because it sets us free. And Joanna reminds us and ends on this. She says, removing the unjust cause of resentment, you will immediately awaken in a landscape without darkness. You will, dis you will rediscover life and disarm yourself in relation to others whom you have disliked or with whom you have remained on your guard. Moreover, the harm they do to you can upset you only with your consent. Otherwise, it returns to its source. I don't accept it. It goes back. Therefore, live, let us live without bitterness. Purify yourself, Joanna says. Resentment, never. So resentment is not something we can wish away. It is not something we can just snap our fingers and it's going to go away. No, resentment must be understood. It's a part of us that is reacting and once we can understand and give compassion to ourself, we can give compassion to others. In Buddhism, they call it metta. And translated, it means something like loving kindness. So I need to show loving kindness to myself, and we need to show loving kindness to others. That's going to free us and release us from these chains that bind us. For so many lifetimes, we've been carrying around these emotions of hate, of resentment for the things that other people have not done or haven't lived up to our expectations. So we resent them. So as we end today, we wanted to end on a moment of forgiveness and letting go of resentment. We wanted to end with a very small, short, and sweet little, um, I would say, like a technique. It's not a guided meditation. It's none of that. I just want you to close your eyes right now. Close your eyes. And I want you to think of something that you might be aware of that you're resentful of. Something, someone. 
And we want you to now visualize that person as if they were now born as your son or daughter. And how much love you'd want to give to them. How helpless they are. How much they need your love and guiding support. And now we want you to see them as a small child, maybe around three or four. They're standing before you and you're looking down at them. Once again, they're in this helpless position and they're scared and they don't know what to do and they're hurting. This is their opportunity, your opportunity to embrace them, forgive them, love them, shower them, because we know that love covers a multitude of sins. Many of us are that small hurt child seeking love and acceptance and forgiveness. And we walk around in our adult bodies. But what we need to do is to show loving kindness to ourselves and to others. To any time you feel this anger this resentment, imagine that person as a small child or a little baby, helpless and in need. And allow all the love in your heart and your soul to pour out to them. And you'll begin to be free of those chains that hold you down. We thank you all for participating this evening in our talk, in our presentation. It has been our pleasure. Um, and let me switch out screen, uh, my screen real quick just to get back to where I need to get to. And okay, here we are. As you are getting yourself back to see you again in the system, there, yeah. Jason, we would like to thank you uh, for this amazing um, talking, um, sharing with us this this uh, much needed awareness, you know, around resentment, you know, what it does to us, um, how it can affect our bodies, right? Where does it come from, and how do we connect? How do we disconnect? What are the things that we can do? Hopefully, uh, both um, um, coming from outside and within ourselves, right, to um, um, alleviate ourselves from this uh, feeling which is in, in some sense, you know, an extension of um, our ways to protect ourselves, right? Um, as, sure. you, as you uh, mentioned earlier, it is a, um, a, a feeling that we need to uh, acknowledge that it's there in order for us to help ourselves, you know, treating it and um, helping others as well um, as we give our hands to one another by saying, hey, hang in there, right? Let's not you know, fall into despair and into resentment. So thank you again. Um, and, you know, I would like to show um, just some, you know, our hellos from, you know, our friends, Ida Sam, Chris saying hello. Um, <laughs> uh, Rosada also. Um, Yasko connected with us again. Hello, Yasko. Paula, you know, connected with us and, and many others who are watching us um, uh, throughout this moment and who will be watching us in the future too. Right. We hope yeah. that many, many of our friends and, and uh, viewers also connect with this message to really alleviate themselves from this feeling of resentment beautifully uh, brought by Jonah DeAngelis. So let us go ahead and share some of the, uh, um, 
questions and comments that we have here. Uh, we would like to start, if I'm not correct here, it is, okay. It is from Paula uh, and she asks, our fragile temperament akin to Elaine Aaron's highly sensitive person who has thin boundaries and easily observes another's energy, another's energy. Yeah, I think this also relates to somehow um, our ability to just you know, sense others. And 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 I know that Elaine Aaron's, um, you know, refers to thin boundaries. Um, and so the term boundary can have different meanings for different people. But for the sake of this question and conversation, we're just going to imagine boundaries just like a layer of ourselves that are thinner. So... The question is, are fragile temperaments akin to um, fragile temperaments? I know she's referring to, I, I guess you're referring to uh, what Joanna was talking about. Um, yes, I do believe it's similar to what Elaine Aaron's referring to. If Elaine Aaron's definition is when we are yet still working on ourselves, and we haven't come to that full, uh, what you know, Abraham Maslow might refer to as a, this level of self-actualization, this level where we have peaked, where we we reached our max of just total understanding uh, and love for all. You know, until we reach that point, we're all in this process of getting there. So we all have fragile temperaments. Um, we don't want this to be seen as something like, oh, we think when we, when we hear the word fragile, we think, oh gosh, weak people, like, oh, that person is weak. They don't know how to you know, do anything. They're just so like, oh, they're weak minded or weak physically, you know, that there's all types of negative connotations to that. But all this means is that we are on a journey of evolution. We are on this journey of evolution, of progress. And we can get there faster or we can reach our self-actualization faster or a little bit faster when we are able to come to terms and be able to make this self-analysis. Because when we are when we absorb other people's energies, you know, that we begin to dive into a little bit more so of the spiritual aspect of things which I think this, you know, we don't even have enough time today to go into that. Um, but there are people that can feel other people's emotions, that can sense what they're feeling. You know, the highly um, empathic people of the world, they can take on other people's emotions, when in reality, what we need to be doing is protecting ourselves. We need to learn how to protect ourselves, not from feeling empathy, but taking that in and owning it as ourselves, being able to experience it and express uh, sympathy and compassion and love towards others without getting down to their level and being depressed and sad. Let me give you a perfect example of this. It happened recently virtually at work. Someone was, uh, we were beginning of a, uh, a retreat and someone um, in our virtual class um, was asked or was asked how, how they were doing just as a an icebreaker and the person i believe even unknowingly didn't mean to do this but they were like well you know things have been tough pandemic you know a lot of deaths in the family and then this person just happened to mention that they had someone who, uh, a family member that just died like the previous week and then this person began weeping on camera and it was uh, um a male which one might think, you know, stereotypically, right? Men don't cry, boys don't cry. But that became a catalyst. There was a domino effect. So then multiple people began crying because everyone could feel his pain. So everyone was feeling his pain and also pain of their own. So it's just something for us to think about. It's not necessarily bad. Everything has to deal with how we deal with such things. You know, if I can feel others' emotions and be okay and manage that and not feel like it's harming me, great. So I perhaps didn't fully answer your question and I'm fully aware that I think I didn't because I think uh, some of that will go into mediumship and much more of the spiritual aspects of life, um, which Paul, like you and I can talk offline about. 
Thank you, Kirsten. Yeah. And then we move on to uh, Abby, uh, who said, I was driving. This is the moment that you actually said that, you know, if you're driving, you should be watching. <laughs> but she stopped, as you said here. Um, but this is such an, an important topic. I pulled over to listen. Psychological residue, possibly from a past life also? Although Joanna doesn't refer, doesn't mention it can be from past life, I, I don't see why it couldn't be. Sure. I don't see why it couldn't be. We carry from one life to a next, one life to another, our emotional, let's say, baggage, which often has a negative connotation. We realize that, but for lack of a better term, it's the luggage we bring with us. It's the emotional luggage. That's what we're going to call for now, not baggage, because baggage has a negative connotation. It's the emotional luggage we, we carry with us. So in some of that luggage has a residue. You know, when people say, oh, I, that left, there's a phrase in, Eng, in the English language that says, well, that left a bad taste in my mouth. And that means, well, you went through an experience and that left you with this residue of like, just not good. So yeah, that can carry on from one life to the next. I, I don't see why it couldn't. Great question. The it's that the oil residue in your hand, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Great yeah. analogy, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. And then we um, um, bring Paul again, um, asking, when children who have not been educated in emotional intelligence and lack healthy role models feel resentment, isn't it inevitable they will create the roots of these degenerative processes? I, um, I love this question. This is very thought provoking, Paula, and and please leave this on the screen because um, I wanted to touch. There's there's so many. This is a profound question, and it merits much more of just a five minute response. Let me say that. First, I'll say if we look at children as all, if we look at all of us of having as just one lifetime, everything seems everything is is unfair. It's unjust. But because we live multiple lifetimes that we aren't even uh, cognitively aware of, but we live so many lifetimes and so many things occur, that so-called innocent child has been an adult for many other lifetimes. So the, when children who have not been educated in emotional intelligence lack healthy role models, feel resentment, you know, can that isn't it inevitable they'll create the roots of degenerative process, processes? Yes, it can. It can. There's there's a propensity. There's a statistical um, percentage that it is possible that that will happen. But it doesn't mean that it has to happen or that it will happen. But the circumstances have been put so that it's a possibility. But we have something that's so beautiful that God has given us, and that's free will. Free will and an incessant desire to progress. Why are those two things relevant? Those two are, things are relevant because that's why there's a billion dollar industry in the self help industry. It's a billion dollar, million, trillion dollar industry because we have this desire to get better, to want to get better. There are children, uh, people that grow up from broken homes, quote unquote, broken homes that continue this negative process that end up causing themselves illness. Yes. But each one of us are children of God. We are given opportunities. And so we are not victims. We are put in situations where we are meant to learn from. Again, if we were to look at it from solely one lifetime, it's totally unjust. From one lifetime point of view, there, it doesn't make any sense. It seems unfair. But life is fair. And there's a purpose for everything. So even if these degenerative processes have taken root much like a plant that can be rooted out, this too can happen. 
so yes, to answer your question plainly, Paula, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kirsten. And then uh, Paula again, and a follow-up question here. Um, doesn't this well-researched uh, in clinical analysis of resentment suggest the need for nonviolence communication, training, and much more, and et cetera? Yes, it does. It does. It does. It does. It is a call on a global scale for the re-education of our own communication, uh, specifically nonviolent communication and emotional intelligence. We are seeing that be starting to be interwoven and it has been for the last decade or so interwoven into a lot of different curriculums. Um, and even when even <clears throat> the US government <clears throat> offers its employees free training throughout the year, every year. It's not mandatory. Please note that it's not mandatory, but they, they do offer uh, trainings on a basically uh, emotional intelligence, nonviolent communication, all those new ways of dealing with ourselves and society. But unfortunately, those, thing, those things aren't uh, mandatory and they aren't necessarily taught in school necessarily but for sure all this research is telling us but if you know it's telling us that we need to change but anyone who's ever understood research and medicine from research to when it actually comes to fruition there's a huge gap of time huge for thousands of reasons we won't get into so the, it, it's going to be time and constant new research is coming out. So I'd say hold, hold the hope and do our best. Thank you, Kirsten. And we move on to um, Yasko asking, regarding good diet and mental state, could it be that the higher levels of dopamine, serotonin, provided by healthier GI bacteria to the brain would elevate the threshold for resentment to affect our psychosomatic system? Oh, I love this question. Thank you so much, Yasko, because just recently we were doing our own research. Um, we, I, we listened to this lecture that was given um, just a few years ago about uh, in the world of psychiatry, you know, and, and neuropsychiatry about the effects of glutamate when it comes to depression, anxiety, you know, because in the world of psychiatry, we have, they have looked at dopamine and serotonin as the big guys, like, oh, we have to manage dopamine, serotonin. Those are the big guys we got to manage. But now there's a shift. We're not saying that dopamine, serotonin, that those aren't important and that, 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 you know, promote healthier um, gastrointestinal systems. Absolutely. But they're beginning to look at glutamate and they're beginning to look at the effects of that and how that relates to psych psychiatric disorders, anxiety, depression, things of that nature, because this is also what you're, we're talking about here and inflammation. So, yes, regarding diet and mental state, um, could it be that higher levels of dopamine and serotonin provided by healthier GI bacteria to the brain would elevate the threshold for resentment to affect our psychosomatic system? <sighs> It's kind of like asking, can the outside, can the extrinsic affect the intrinsic? If we have our own propensity for it, if we already have a tendency towards that emotion, sure. It's theoretically, hypothetically, makes sense if we have a propensity for it. But if I'm not a resentful person and that perfect, um, agar plate is created for me and I'm not going to become this resentful person because the outside but once again if I have a tendency in my emotional luggage if you will to be that kind of person then yes the extrinsic the external is going to trigger the internal that's why it's helpful to that's why science is looking at anti-inflammatory um, 
diets to help mitigate, not cure, but mitigate the effects of a lot of these illnesses and diseases and disorders. So then it will give us the opportunity to focus on our emotions. Because when you think about Abraham, Abraham Maslow's, you know, hierarchy, we need to first solve our physiological issues. We can't get beyond that. It's very hard to deal with like stressful mental, emotional states when I am still physically ill, where I'm battling just um, food deprivation. When I, I'm not sure if I'm going to food insecurities and I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to be eating every day. You know, the basic human needs, when those things are not, you know, mitigated and brought to a point where I can relax and then begin to work on other parts of myself, we're not going to move on. That's why we tend to see third world countries stay third world countries for so many centuries because it's like they never can get a breath of air because they're in that constant state of got to stay alive in you know, that 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 um state of um self-preservation so there's my answer for you uh yasko thank you for your question these are great questions thank you kirsten for um you know and sharing this ideas if you want to jump in at any time please you know Yes, no, I was going to say in this area here, I think that you, you touched on a really interesting uh, part of it, which is the actual balance, right? The, the balance that we have to bring to ourselves, you know, when we analyze the internal and the external. Um, yeah, I mean, there is much for us to study in terms of um, one affecting the other. Um, that, yes, that there will be, you know, consequences where, you know, we allow ourselves to, we allow the external to break in, right? Um, but most importantly, um, we also have to analyze how me, you know, uh, you know, the, the with the baggage that I have, say enough is enough. You know, I don't want to allow myself to go in this road. And it remind me of a case that, um, you know, a friend of mine was telling me that the, you know, a family member, you know, is in constant pain, um, gastric pain. Right. And for whatever reason, I mean, yeah, we didn't get into it. Uh, that this person sometimes relating to other family members is not tolerant, right? And they, because of some of the things that has happened, whether good or bad, the person kind of holds this resentment, right? It, they cannot let go. Um, and I think, again, it's an internal issue that the person has, a physical, right? Um, mm -hmm. That can be triggered by something internal as well in, ter in terms of, um, you know, um, a mental disturbance or whatnot, whatever it is. Um, but it also affects the external, right? How do they relate to the environment they're, where they're in, right? Where everything is negative, everything is is tough, right? Because the person's in pain. So I'm giving this example that, you know, just for us to kind of illustrate a little bit more on how one connects with the other and how it can affect the external, the internal. So uh, very well put. I think that it's important for us to highlight to all of it because th there is no such set formula and i think there is a lot of i think us you know through the studies that we're you know that is coming up we'll learn way more from these studies too right instead of just saying here's the the silver bullet yeah very interesting question from from chris as well when he says um is there any easy way we could just tell people we resent what what or how they hurt us or even how they misunderstood us I worry the only way to let things go is to tell people how I feel, but a not in a nice way. Also, will it make people think less of us if we tell them we don't like what they did however long ago? Three, three questions that can be broken into other <laughs> ideas, right? But yeah. very, a very good question. Very good question, Chris. And this is something we, we all of us at some point in our lives have struggled with and have felt, you know, whether to really lay it all out there, as they say, put all your cards on the table or keep it to yourself. So I'm going to tell you a story that is not my story. It is a story that I heard, but I'm going to tell it from the first person because it's a, it's a whole lot easier to tell that way. So let's just pretend this is my story. Okay, remember, this is not my story. So I recently went on a trip to the mountains with my husband and my kids. And it was a five hour drive. 
there and back five hours each way. And of course, as you can imagine with little kids, you know, it could be really challenging being in the car for five hours. So, but we went up to the lake, had a great time, you know, spent a week there. Fantastic. Awesome. So, you know, obviously there was a point where we had to come home, pack the kids in. My husband decided to drive home. So as my husband's beginning to drive home, you know, my children um, under the age of seven are kind of, you know, making noises and getting really restless in the back because as you can imagine, it's a five hour drive. So I'm doing all I can as a wife to just, you know, uh, keep the kids entertained and trying to keep them quiet so my husband can focus on the road um, and not be stressed about and distracted. So we go through the five hour drive home, we get there and the ride was great. You know, five hours, it felt like, you know, just constant work on my part because I had to constantly, constantly be like doing things with the kids from the, from the front seat of the car, looking at them in the van in the back. So, you know, by the time I, we get home, I'm exhausted emotionally, like just exhausted from all this work, but I get home and my husband parks the car and we get out and I, I say, I turn to him and I say, honey, that was a great drive. Thank you so much for getting us home safe. And he turns to me and says, thanks. He proceeds to go to the back of the car, get the luggage. And I begin to fume and all this anger begins to bubble up and I begin to resent him. Now, being the kind of person that I am, I took a step back and said, okay, why am I feeling these feelings? Now, mind you, my husband has no idea what's going on. He's getting the luggage out of the car. He's getting the kids out. They're going into the house. And I'm just standing there fuming, foaming at the mouth. But I take a step back because, I, you know, being who I am, I took a step back and said, let me think about this. Why am I feeling resentful? So I realized I was feeling resentful because I had the expectation that my husband was going to turn to me and say, oh, and by the way, you're welcome, but thank you so much for five hours for entertaining the kids, for making sure that they were okay during the five hour drive, for, you know, being like their, you know, leader and, and ahead of all the game and activities in the car and making sure that they were calm so that the drive, that I could focus on the ride, that thank you wife for all the hard work that you did. I resented him because he didn't say that. He didn't acknowledge, he didn't live up to my expectation. And then I had another thought, why do I need validation from him? Why can't I thank myself? Why can't I give that love and acknowledgement to myself that I did something good? So the, the idea here is not to focus on the other person and what they've done but it's to step back and get curious about your own reactions and feelings in that moment or those moments you were hurt and ask yourselves, ask yourself why I feel that way and how can I provide to myself what I need? Because often, especially in relationships, we hold this uh, belief, whether it's conscious or not, that others are responsible for making us happy. But if I were to come to you right now and say, if someone were to come to me right now and say to me, Kirsten, you're responsible for my happiness, my immediate reaction would be, the heck it's not. That is not my job. So why is it anybody else's job to make you happy or to accept you? as you are or to praise you that is our job first and foremost so when you ask this question i know i'm not answering you directly but i'm asking you to go dig deeper into yourself first our general reaction is to react to automatically say, well, I want to put it out there. I want to just say this is how I feel and then I'll be done with it. But that it does not solve the issue because what you, what happened, the situation that happens that you were triggered, much like this 
story I pretended was mine, but it's not. Much like I was triggered in the car with my husband when we got home. That, I, that in my mind, I created this whole story because I had done all this work that he should congratulate me and give me kudos. Is it nice to get kudos from your loved ones? Absolutely it is. But the point is in all of this is to not focus, is to not take the lens, our lens, and focus it on somebody else. Because this is what society, this is what we do on small and large scales. We focus on the other person that's causing us the pain. And we say, this is them. They're causing me the pain. They're the problem. And spiritism says, uh-uh. No, it's not. Get curious. Step back. There are times when you can communicate in a healthy way your emotions, but there are a lot of times where you cannot for so many different reasons. But first and foremost, and regardless of the situation that you're in, first and foremost, Take a step back mentally and emotionally. Do a self-evaluation. Ask yourself, get curious. Why do I feel this way? And how can I love myself? Thank you, Kirsten. I, I would like, I know we're pressed with time here and there is one more comment with fiasco, which I believe that my comment and, and um, quote unquote question uh, will connect with fiasco. So I'll, I'll say it and then I'll bring fiasco's uh, comment over here. When you brought the passage from the Bible in terms of us, um, uh, um, we, as we go and we, you know, as we go to the altar, altar and we offer something, right? We mm -hmm. have to go back and reconcile with our brothers and sisters. Um, we know, and and we know how hard that is, right? To to get such a thing done, in a compassion, um, from a compassion standpoint, where you know we ought to do that with ourselves first. Right. We mm -hmm. ought to love ourselves first. We ought to um, forgive ourselves for the things that we have done. Not to say that we're not, you know, we're not going to be responsible, that we have to rectify what we have done. But I think this is a good reminder as well for us to look at and say, look, you know, this reconciliation, is it just for me and, you know, my neighbor or with, you know, Leo and I, right, in terms of, you know, the perhaps the Leo that I was yesterday or the things that I have done as well. And if we don't have anything within ourselves that we can go back to and rescue, perhaps it could be something from the past. So, you know, it's a question of affirmation, at least to me, it make, it brings me comfort. And it kind of connects to what Yasko is saying here, too, when she says, we all carry our own wounds and therefore easy to be impacted by bad interactions, by resentments. As it is difficult to know others' motive to hurt us, perhaps we have to know ourselves deeper in order to cope better with the various sources of resentment, right? Exactly, 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 Yasko. You, you hit the nail on the head. That is a way, understanding ourselves deeper. And we learn through the writings of Joanna, through Spiritism, that the more we work on ourselves, the more we work on ourselves, the more we understand how difficult it is to change. And through that, we gain more compassion for others and for ourselves. Because sometimes when we're not working on ourselves and we have this mindset of everyone needs to change, those usually it's because, you know, we, because we're in a mindset where we're not really working a whole lot on ourselves. Perhaps. Otherwise, we would understand that it's really hard to change, really hard to change a singular bad habit. So once we gain more compassion for ourselves, we're able to give it to others. Well, Kirsten, thank you so much. Um, this is all the questions, comments that I have, that we have. Um, the, you know, I would like just to share here, um, Abby saying such a wonderful talk. Thank you. Aida uh, Sema saying, thank you. Um, thank you oh. so much, Kirsten. Uh, really an important topic to think and put into practice. It yeah. is much so. And, and, and I think that this is uh, an amazing, uh, still start of the year, even though we're already in the second month of the year, to say, let, you know, let go of the resentment. Um, let us take you know, a, a good look at ourselves and find out if we have the residue inside of us. And if we do, it's okay, right? There's nothing wrong with that. 
uh, we just have to find out, I mean, how can I get rid of, right? Uh, healthy ideals, um, uh, healthy uh, uh, diets, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Let's renew ourselves and let go with these resentments. Um, and not be afraid that perhaps tomorrow we may face other ones, right? We may let go of what we have of the past and it's okay to for us to you know, endure other ones, things that may happen to us. Um, and that's how we grow. You know, we take one step at a time and we wish that others, you know, follow the same way and um, as we focus on ourselves. So I'll pass the word to you uh, to say, to give your final sentences and um, perhaps ask you to um, uh, say the final prayer too, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, everyone, for participating and being a part of this presentation today. Um, we thank most of all our dear sister Joanna DeAngelis and the medium Givaldo Franco for bringing such messages to the masses in English, allowing each one of us in this land to understand these deep ideas. We thank you, our Father, Mother, God, our beloved Jesus, our spirit benefactors, for this moment together, for your assistance, and allowing this moment to be fruitful for all those who have been connected this evening. Dear God, we know that there are so many hearts, so many souls that are hurting. And we know that we continue to try our best. And yet sometimes we still fall short. Forgive us. May we get up and try again. May we forgive ourselves and forgive others. May our heart, compassion, our love grow every day to serve and assist and to find the divine light inside of us, to find our connection to divinity. We thank you, dear God, for this life, for this moment, for these opportunities, and so be it.